So, I want to give you guys a little bit of context because I think this helps. It's important to know where you are at in history, right? Because changes have occurred for mankind in history, in the past, right? Like, people were on farms at one point. Most mankind was doing agricultural type stuff. And then things changed, and now there's a lot of people in cities, right? So, so something happened, right? So we're at that point. We're at a turning point from where we were historically with education into a new future. So every technology that's come along from the printing press to the internet has created dramatic change. You don't always notice it if you're not um, paying attention. So it's good to have this perspective because it makes you feel calmer <laughs> and uh, not so afraid and freaked out by the future. So every 60 years, according to uh, Carlota Perez, who wrote this book about this, there's been a turning point. And before we got to the turning point, there was a crisis and a recession. Sound familiar? Did we have a recession a few years ago? So it starts like this. There's the birth of a technology. There's an installation period. Then there's a crisis. Then there's deployment, a prosperity, exhaustion, and a new cycle. This is how that plays out. The installation is 20 to 30 years. There's rapid growth. A lot of capital investment funding, which has gone on in education for quite a while. If you go to the big investment conferences like I have, massive amount of money coming into ed tech. It's like huge. And then a crisis and a recession, then a deployment moving into a golden age. All of the national markets except for education are here. They're after. Education is lagging by a good number of years behind every other industry in terms of adoption and transition into tech. So let's show you how that works. In, in 1771, we had an industrial revolution, and then we had a panic, canal panic, and then we had a boom economically. In 1829 was the big growth of steam and railways. Okay, then there was the railway panic, and then the boom. In 1875, there was a lot of focus on steel, electricity, heavy engineering. Big depression in 1893, economic collapse in many countries. This is when Germany you had to have a wheelbarrow full of money to buy a loaf of bread, and then a boom. In 1908, we had the oil, automobiles, and mass production. Big stock market crash in 1929, the Great Depression. Imagine this, extremism in World War II. Does it resonate with anyone? <laughs> and then we had a boom. So in 1971 was the Intel microchip. This is sort of a, a moment, right? Then we had the dot-com bust in 2000 our present global financial collapse in 2008, slow or no growth, and imagine this, ri uh, uh, extremism, rising extremism. What's happening with the life force known as mankind on Earth is incursion of new technology disrupts the flow, and it makes change. So right now in 2018, like I said, the bulk of the economy is here. It's headed for steady growth, and it will be for a long time. But education is still in the capital investment funding and the frenzy, trying to figure it out. Does anyone in the room feel like it's completely figured out yet? No. It's kind of a hodgepodge. It's like a mosaic. I got some software over here, and I got this over there, and I got that over there, and blah, 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 blah. It's messy. It's extremely messy. So it's not really figured out yet, right? So we're not even at the crisis and recession point yet in education, but it's coming. Little parts of it hit, hit the crisis already, like the single sign-on part, like everybody's onto that one. They need a single sign-on. But the rest of it we have yet to do. We have yet to pull books away from everybody and go to full digital, right? People don't understand the cost structure shift, how much money can be saved when you provide a window of only you know, two weeks of access to a book. It's way cheaper in digital form than it is buying the book 
shelving it, shipping it around, all that other stuff. But you have to understand cost structure and the shift in digital for real. So that's what's actually happening. Um, so we're also in education in 2018. We've moved from worried about hardware to software. Everyone's into software right now, everywhere you go. And a little freaked out by it. Because looking at a book is pretty different than looking at a piece of software. Like these guys just showed you a demo. So you understand a little bit now about their navigation and how they're structured. But if you have to do that for every single subject, every single grade, it's going to consume some time. Because it's not like flipping open a book. Scrolling through it a little bit, right? You got to log in, you got to check it out, you got to navigate around, you got to see what it's worth, you got to sort of comparison analysis it. And not every software company is telling you this is the LTU or less than time used per object, right? They don't tell you how much time is in that. They don't explain what analytics are going to hit you out of that. They don't jive with any other analytics that you have. So you have issues. This is a moment for us, right? How we're going to interpret all this stuff. <clears throat> so, we're also moving in terms of leadership from just being tech consumers, going, this is cool. Yeah, let's like do it, right? Let's give everybody an iPad. We're moving from that to actually considering ourselves being tech leveraged. Very different attitude, right? Being leveraged means that you understand the technology is supposed to be doing some work for you, not just being like a doodad that's nifty, right? Um, so let's share. Why has education escaped the adoption of efficiencies as a view and technology that have allowed I other industries to flourish and grow? What's happening? Go ahead. It's a public institution, unlike yeah. the private institution, right? So, I mean, yeah. you're very much like a public domain. And yeah. We have a lot of voices that we have to listen to before decisions can be made. Yeah, it's a group. Yeah. It's a group, yeah. What do you think is going to do to, what, what's going to happen to, to coalesce real change. What do you think? So I think a sense of urgency, right, has to be kind of, has to be felt. It has to be felt by the public. Um, and then it's also, you know, we're a 50 state union. So the way that it's felt is going to be different depending upon where you're located. So yeah. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be different depending upon where you're at. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, that's why we're on the road talking about this forthcoming consumerization. We know that that's happening because the revenue in that space is huge. So the issue is, is like, at what point in time do people get their act together and knit it all together in, in a seamless pathway, right? At that point, it's a game changer. So what we're saying is, do you really want to wait until that happens and you lose 50% of your kids? Or do you want to try to level up right now? Everywhere that we're going in the country, uh, we just saw this in Philadelphia, we saw Minnesota, fifth of the kids to a quarter of the kids already gone, right? So there's the writings on the wall. Go ahead. In addition, we also have two major issues. One is money, but the other one is an equity issue. Ah, it's we true. We have a lot of kids who have no <coughs> access to technology. They have no access to the computers, and they also have no access to the internet at home. So what do we do about that? Yeah, I'm really worried about that because there could be a really, really deep divide yeah. if consumerization happens for real yeah. and, you know, 35% of the kids go up into the extreme unschooling thing and they're doing really great and then you have this huge number who, yeah, that's why we're talking about this. It has to be something that's addressed. I totally agree. Yeah. Anybody else? Go ahead. Besides the deployment of um, current technologies, it's also the professional learning of our teachers. Yeah. Um, even within the same district, you can hop from one school to the other and see uh, a great difference, and also on the populations of the students as well. Um, where in one situation, you might have a parent community that pretty much forces the schools to make sure that this is happening. And you have others that just believe in the school and hope that everything goes well. Yeah, isn't that interesting? All the surveys show that your local school, according to the parent, is great, but education's failing overall, right? There's a really interesting dynamic there. 
Uh, what we see all over the country is that the wealthier districts are the biggest resistance because they have parents who've succeeded in life. So they don't want change and they're very vocal about it. It's the failing schools and the poorer schools that are the first to go the distance, which is interesting, right? But it's the wealthy schools that really need to, especially the big districts. Did you have something too? Um, in your research, have you looked at the leadership makeup? For example, those of us were born with paper, taught in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and our leadership positions right now have never had the experience to go out to the digital world. Yeah. Uh, how much does that contribute to? That's about 99%. <laughs> um, if you watched Congress um, question Zuckerberg, you get what I'm saying. Like if I buy chocolate and then, and then the internet knows I bought chocolate and shows me more ads for chocolate, what does that mean? Was that you, Facebook? Like I just want to. So. Follow up. I'm just substituting the word education for healthcare. Yeah. Um, I don't think we're the only industry that hasn't gone over that. Well, healthcare is very interesting because you don't get to see the doctor until you've been through quite a few nurses. The doctor doesn't give you your shots, doesn't do everything for you. Whereas in education, the teacher is everything. It's the center pin on almost everything. Um, but you maybe don't need to have that that exact way. There's a huge amount of time that you're studying the material and you're uh, doing activities that could be overseen by paraprofessionals, right? And you take your total um, topic experts and leverage them <clears throat> against a model that allows you to totally personalize. Right? So, so we're playing with some of these models right now. There, there's a, a private school up in Washington State that's we're actually working with to describe exactly what the titles and roles would be. And like I said, we believe there's gonna to need to be more people in it. And you might have a triage pattern where you have somebody who does all the pre-planning, then you have the execution person who's coming in and just doing it. They're your teacher facilitator extraordinaire and they're handling all the different things happening in, in an actual class environment. But you don't have as many class environments as before. And then you have somebody who's the follow-up person who is um, managing all the formative and summative testing and then providing the guidance back to role number one which is now customized and then you have the person that executes because if you have to do all of that all three of those parts which is build deploy uh, reiterate back it's a lot for one person if you're trying to personalize for every single person every single student so if you divide those three roles now you have the equivalent like to a news anchor, right? As the middle role, the guide, the person doing it live in the classroom. And each of those three roles could be different functions for different subjects, right? So you get, you get like an exciting job shift. I think this should be super exciting for teachers, right? Like, wow, this could be like fun. Like maybe I could work from home in my pajamas once in a while, like the Atlanta schools. I think that'd be cool. Anything else? No? Two minutes? Anybody else? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just noticing that in from looking from the outside in, uh, five years ago when I was still in the classroom and kind of in charge of tech, trying to get a device, one-to-one -one for teachers only, was a struggle. And then now, so then three years after that, so about two years ago-ish, um, I'm at a company, ed tech company, calling on schools and superintendents and they're telling me we're not one to one yet uh, we're not even six to one yet and then what and then this year that's rare i've noticed yeah and this year i've noticed everybody i call that's not the issue anymore it's it's the pd and so the devices are there now which is in terms of the history lesson um the yeah the hardware is there and now it's the software uh, mosaic as you were saying and um the curriculum building and structuring of it all. It's, it's hard. Interesting. And then the hardware at home, I was noticing even five years ago teaching, 10 years, well not 10, but five, I was noticing this, even the lowest socioeconomic school that I was teaching at, every parent had a smartphone. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how that happened. That's true of back countries and other nations, right? Like 
Africa. They got a smartphone. It's like amazing, right? Yeah, so 85% of all students in America have a device either issued to them, a BYOD or whatever laptop cars. They have 85% of kids in America have a device for a significant portion of the day. So if you run into a school that isn't one to one yet, it's super rare. Go ahead. Well, I've been pouring through our LCAP survey data the last couple of weeks. And um, our district, we're, we're not one to one. We are financially constrained. Um, we have a lot of cool failing devices. And so for the last two years, our parents were saying, we want equitable distribution of devices. We want one to one. We want more devices. And this year, that is just low, 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 low down on the list. Now they're saying, wait a minute, we want to know how are you using technology and are you using it effectively? And is it really leading to student growth? And um, are you keeping our kids safe? And so our our teachers as well, everyone is, is stopping and saying, okay, we had the Wild West for a few years where we were trying everything. Over 3,100 apps in our district that we're actively using right now. Wow. We have wow. 600 students. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's scary. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> we need to stop and look and see what is really having an impact, what is really effective. And I think that that does kind of slow down. Uh, the adoption of different technologies because we're asking good questions. You are. Before it was, let's try everything and hope something works. And now it's, okay, let's look at what we're trying <laughs> and be really judicious and meaningful about what we're going to do. That's super great. Well, you're in the crisis and recession moment, right? You're there. Um, 3,100. Houston ISD has over 2 million digital learning objects in their library. 2 million. I think DC, when we looked, they have over 100 courseware options. That's just the courseware, it doesn't, not the apps and the loose digital file, video, blah, blah. Um, this is very messy. But you're doing the right thing, right? You're looking. Because until you look as a leadership team, you can't really lead. It's a looking that's missing from most of leadership because they really don't know. They don't really understand software. So we're on a mission to help you really understand software and hopefully we're going to help you out a little bit.